You're good whenever you're ready. Thank Excellent. You. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, so we're on the very last line of a pay base, Amud base. We have a machlokis in the Mishnah between uh, Rabbi Yochanan ben Broca on the one hand and Rabbi Shimon on the other hand regarding what's the size of uh, the loaf uh, that uh, would typically be set aside for Erebe Tzpumin. A loaf was uh, viewed as sufficient for two meals. So, so Rabbi Yochanan ben Broca is of uh, the opinion that uh, a loaf is the equivalent of, uh, say, six eggs, which is one quarter of a kav. A kav is a measurement uh, which is um, the equivalent of uh, 24 eggs. So this loaf would be six eggs, and half of that loaf would be um, a loaf that I would split it in half, and we would call that a pras. We would call that a, um, a piece of uh, the loaf. So when we speak about kedei achilas pras, so that would be enough for like one meal's worth, since one loaf is the equivalent of two meals, so a pras is the equivalent of one meal. That's why we say that when you're supposed to eat something in the course of a meal, you're supposed to eat it during the time period of kedei achilas pras. So according to Rabbi Yochanan and Boka, a pras would be three eggs. Um, and that's in fact how the Rambam paskins when it comes to the calculation of kedei achilas pras, the amount of time that it would take to eat a bread that has the volume of uh, three uh, of three eggs, which we generally assume is around six ounces, but we're not going to get into uh, ounces for purposes of uh, this discussion. If you look at the screen share, so I have a uh, description of uh, this calculation according to Rabbi Yoshua ben Broca. According to Rabbi Shimon, a loaf is one third of a cup, which is the equivalent of eight eggs. Now he has this complicated shita in the Mishnah where you don't use the whole loaf for the two meals of the Erev Eitzchumin. That's because for Erev Eitzchumin, we tend to be mako. We're leaning into saying, nah, it's only two thirds of the loaf. But you can disregard that for purposes of the remaining calculations. A loaf is uh, fundamentally um, a, a, uh, the amount for uh, two meals uh, in the normal course, which would be eight eggs. So that if I was calculating a half of that, which would be a pras, it would be four eggs. Uh, so uh, that's how Rashi uh, calculates the amount of Gedei Achilas pras. And you find discussions in the Mishnah Brura and you know, later post him, do we pass them like Rashi, like the Rambam, which really is a question, do we pass like Rabbi Shimon? Do we pass like Rabbi Yeshua ben Broca? So when it comes to, Dar we always go, whichever shear is more machmir, we're gonna follow when it comes to the right? the law says the Mishnah Brura, whichever shear is more mako, we're going to follow when it comes to uh, the Rabbanan laws. So anyway, so this gets us to a pras. So a pras, which is half of the loaf sufficient for one meal, um, uh, would be um, uh, four. Uh, would, would be would be four eggs, according to uh, Rabbi Shimon. Would be three eggs, according to Rabbi Yoshua ben Broca. Okay, so uh, and that is the amount that if a person walked into a house which had been quarantined uh, for being a bias hamenuga for having saras. A person stayed the amount of time that it would take to eat uh, the amount of bread that would be a pras, so he would become tummy. That's that's the other base of menuga. That's the first part of uh, the Gemara. That's the base of menuga. Half of whatever is the loaf that would be uh, two meals, or approximately two meals, according to Rabbi Shimon. Half of that um, would be what we call a pras, and that would cause somebody to be tummy if they stay the amount of time that it would take to eat that amount of four eggs, or you know, according to uh, Rabbi. Uh, according to uh, Rabbi Shimon and three eggs, according to Rabbi Yeshua ben Broca, they would become tummy in a base of menuga. And half of that, meaning half of a pras, um, uh, which would be like, you know, the equivalent of a half meal, uh, lipsol es hagibia, the Mishnah says, if somebody would eat ochlin tzmeim, they would eat unclean food stuff. So then there's a dinder abanan, even though food doesn't normally have the ability to be metame a human being, to be metame a person, a person's body, if a person imbibed, the person ate, uh, they ingested uh, a half of a pras of uh, food, um, uh, which according to Rabbi Shua ben Boko would be say one and a half eggs uh, you know, uh, worth. And um, according to um, Rabbi Shimon would be two eggs worth, of course it'd be a half of four eggs. Um, so then that would cause their body to become tummy. That's what the, the Mishnah says. So the Gemara now at the top of Pei Gimel and Aleph tells us that there's also another shear, which is a quarter of a pras, a half of a half of a pras, um, uh, which uh, would be three quarters of an egg, according to Rabbi Shur ben Broca, and one egg, according to Rabbi Shimon, um, uh, that would could be the sufficient shear, that would be the minimal shear 
um, uh, to enable food to be susceptible to tuma in the first place. So that if, let's say, a dead sheritz would touch it, so the food would, would become tummy. If the food is not even this amount, so then the food doesn't uh, become, uh, then the food doesn't become tummy. Uh, it, it could mean that, or it could mean that, um, that yeah, the food becomes tummy, but this is the amount that, that would be necessary in order for the food to become sufficiently tummy to be metami other things. So tana v'chatsi chatsi chesya, the tame tumas tumas ochlin to convey tuma uh, with respect to, to the tuma of foodstuffs, it would have to be at least that, um, that minimal amount. Okay, fine. The Tana Didan, so why is it that our Tana didn't include this last year, the one quarter of a prasa shear um, uh, for purposes of uh, Tumas, uh, Tumas Ochlin? Why is that? Why was this a shear not included? Um, uh, so my time in Latani Tumas Ochlin, Mishum de lo Lahadadi, because there's too much dispute about exactly how you calculate this final amount. The Tanya, because we see, that we start getting into territory where they're sort of nitpicking exactly how these shiurim play out. The Tanya the Bryce says, Kama shiur chatsi pras. How much is the shear of a half a pras? Let's say, according to Rabbi Shimon, we're assuming that, uh, as Rashi points out, that we're following you know, the opinion of Rabbi Shimon, uh, that a pras is four eggs worth, and therefore a chatsi pras, which is the amount you'd have to eat of unclean foods in order for your body to become tummy, would be two baits in. So it could be that when Chazal were measuring these amounts, they were using, you know, small eggs. They were using small eggs. So, so therefore, um, Rabbi Huda says, how much if we're, you know, looking at our eggs uh, would be sufficient to satisfy this amount? It wouldn't be exactly two eggs because our eggs are a little bit bigger. It would be a little bit less than two eggs. Rabbi Rabbi Yossi says, no. I don't agree. You take our eggs, not only, you know, would it be two eggs, would it even be two eggs using like a generous standard? You know, that it would be two eggs, you know, of, of loosely measured um, so that uh, you get in like, you know, the full eggs and then some of Yossi, I mean, base, whatever, when we say eggs, we mean the volume of, you know, two eggs. Rabbi Yossi, I mean, base, base him so that's a, a, a generous uh, keeping of, you know, a measurement of two eggs. Um, she or Rebbe, base, base him uh, the ode. Um, Rabbi Rebbe measured it out that it came out that the two eggs using our eggs was sort of the reverse of Rabbi Yehuda, that it was two eggs plus a little bit more, uh, meaning that for every single egg, he found an extra 120th. That's in the third paragraph of the screen share. According to Rebbe, one would have to add 120th to each of our eggs. In other words, for every 20 eggs of the original measurement of Rabbi Shimon, there would need to be 21 eggs. So according to our you know, measurement, um, uh, if we were measuring on that, on that basis, you would end up for every 20 eggs, you would end up with 21 eggs because each one has an extra 120th according to our eggs, right? So she already base based in the ode, come the ode, how much is the be ode? As I said, 120th. Rashi has a girsa that really it means 140th, but you know, it's hard enough to understand one girsa, so we're just gonna go with the gear so that's in the Gemara, 120th. Okay, echa beis bebeza, 120th of an egg. Be'ilu gavi tumas ochlin tanya, and that's only when we're dealing with the shear that we actually have in the Mishnah of a one, um, the, the, the one half of a, um, of a pras uh, that uh, causes you to become tummy. If you eat that amount of a food that's tummy, it causes your body to become tummy, which is two eggs according to Rabbi Shimon. And we see that they're like, three different ways of evaluating those three eggs. And it gets hopelessly, uh, when, it, when it comes to evaluating those two eggs, we see that it becomes hopelessly complicated. Um, but when you go one more level to, you know, one half of that amount, which is one quarter of a pras, which would be one egg, according to Rabbi Shimon, there, you know, it, there are so many different, the, the, the opinions are, you know, minakatze, elakatze, so the Mishnah doesn't mention it altogether. Bidu gabi tumas tanya, Rabbi Nassim Rabbi Dosa Amu, Rabbi Nassim Rabbi Dosa say, Kebesa Amu, that one egg amount, according to Rabbi Shimon, of course, said that one quarter of a process, since a process is four eggs, and one quarter of a process will be one egg. So that egg means the egg together with its shell. Shamu Kamoa Uke Klipasa, together with its shell. Well, once I'm going to um, uh, have a, um, you know, add the, um, add the shell uh, as well. So this is going to, you know, uh, make it, you know, a much larger amount. The Chachamim say, 
Kamar below Kli Pasta, it's without the shell uh, altogether. So and that also is going to um, come out to a very small shear uh, compared to Rabbi Dos, Manas and Rabbi Dosa's formulation. So therefore, it's just uh, even less precise. So the Mishnah left it out altogether. So I'm a Rafa and Papa, I'm a Fisla, Zuderi, Rabbi Yudha, Rabbi Yossi. Um, these are the opinions, this brysa that stated how much when you're actually measuring the chatzi pras, the half of the pras to be metami a person, which as we said is two eggs worth. So we had the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda and we had the, the opinion of Rabbi, um, um, uh, uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda said, you measure two eggs so minus a little bit. Rabbi Yossi said, you have a generous measurement of two eggs. So he says, this is all according to the opinion of Rabbi Shimon, as we mentioned. The Chachamim, the Chachamim say they don't follow the opinion of Rabbi, um, uh, of Rabbi Shimon. They follow the opinion of Rabbi Yochanan ben Broka, which if you look in the Ein Mishpat, you see that uh, this opinion of the Chachamim, the Chachamim, and therefore they measure in terms of one and a half eggs. Why do they measure in terms of one and a half eggs? because they're measuring a half a pras. And according to Rabbi Yochanan ben Boka, pras is three eggs. So half of a pras, which is the amount to be metami a person if they, ate too much, if they ate unclean foods, is going to be one and a half eggs. But they say that one and a half eggs, we would measure in a fashion in which we would measure it, you know, loosely, generously, socha kos. Um, if you look in the A Mishpah by the little gimel, you see it says, it gives you a reference to Tumas, Hilchas Tumas Ochlin of the Rambam, because the Rambam, paskins like Rabbi Yochanan ben Boka. That a pras is only three eggs, so half of a pras is one and a half eggs. Okay, so pshita. So we know we can do the math ourselves. I mean, we have the screenshot. My goodness, you know, in front of us, it tells us that Rabbi Yochanan ben Broka holds that half of a pras is one and a half eggs. So why do I need the chachamim to tell me that? Right? Just, 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 just look at the word doc. So it says no. So chakos asa leshmina, and it's teaching us that when you do measure the eggs, you measure it kind of loosely, so kakos. Okay, fine. So that's what the Chokamim are teaching us. So Kiyas Ravdimi Amar, so Ravdimi said that there was a fellow named Bunyas. Bunyas decided he's going to send a saw of a flour um, uh, or, you know, a saw of bread to, to, um, to Rebbe, and it's, it's going to be, you know, the right measurement of what a saw is supposed to be. So Kiyas Ravdimi Amar, Shige Bunyas, Bunyas sent the Rebbe Mudia de Kundias, he sent him the uh, modern day version of the Sa'a. The modern day version of the Sa'a is a, a Mudia de Kundius. Okay, that's, a, um, that's what it's called. That's the name of the Sa'a, says Rashi. Don't ask me. It's called the Mudia de Kundius, but it's a Sa'a. What's a Sa'a exactly? So if you look at the screen share, it says very clearly a Sa'a is six carbon. Okay, so let's do the math here. A Sa'a is six carbon. The, the way to, to, to remember this, there's a, there's a Rosh Yeshiva, of a Yeshiva in, in, a, in Israel called Yishrei Leib. It's an American Yeshiva called Yishrei Leib. The Rosh Yeshiva is a fellow named Rabbi Shaya Greenwald. It's a big time of Chacham, and he used to learn in YU. He used to be like one of the really stark guys in YU many, many years ago. Now he's the Rosh Yeshiva of Yishrei Leib. So one of the things that, that he came up with, which is like an old Misora, you know, in YU based measurement circles, he came up with a way of remembering all of the measurements. Um, the mnemonic is Keaskilav Yagudu. Okay, I didn't even write this down. I should have Keaskilav Yagudu. Keaskilav stands for a core, uh, Eifa, Sa'a, Kav, Lug, Beitza. That's Keaskilav. Yagudu is just the number, the gematria of uh, the, um, the ratio of how many are in the second item as compared to the item beforehand. So Yud is 10, which means that, that there are 10. Aphas in a core. Um, and then Gimel is a three, uh, which means that there are three Sa'as in an Apha and so forth and so forth. So if you, you know, use that chart, you're never going to get confused in terms of all of these ratios and measurements and so forth. You'll be able to remember, like the, at the very end, you have a Bob at the end of Yagudu. And the last two items are a Lav, the Lag, the Lug, and the Beitza, which means that there are six Beitzas that go into a Lug. And before that is a dollar, a four, which means that there are four lugan that go into a, a uh, that, that go into a kab, because the last three letters are kilab, kab, lug, beitza. So this is how you remember all of those things. So based on that, ka'askalab, yagudu, mnemonic, so a sa'a is six kabin. Remember what was sent to Be Rebbe by Bunyas was a sa'a. A sa'a is six kabin. A kab 
is 24 eggs. Therefore, I've done the math for you and for myself too, so I won't get confused, hopefully. Therefore, a sa'ah is 144 eggs, okay? But that's when we started out, my goodness. That was in the original measurement when we were in the midbar, right? You know, when we left Mitzrayim, we went to Eretz Yisrael, we were given laws, we were in the midbar, okay? So that's the original measurement called midbarios. But there are two later measurements. That I'm reading from the screen share so you can follow us in the fourth paragraph over here. One is called Yerushalmios. That was the second type of measurement. They added one sixth to the original measurement of midbarios. They said, oh, you used to get a certain number of, egg, of eggs. Now you'll get even more eggs. Now you'll get even more lugan, okay? But that means that every single egg that's uh, there is actually, you know, uh, evaluated, you know, that, that you don't need as many, uh, as many eggs to get to the original shear. Now, when we say that they added one sixth, what that really means is that they added one fifth, uh, because if you're looking at just at the original number, they added one fifth. So if you had 20 eggs, you add one fifth to that. So you add four in order to get to 24. 20 plus four, four is one fifth of 20, gives you 24. But then when you have the final number, that's called levar, right? So that the four that you added are now one sixth of the new total number, because the new total number is 24. So four is one sixth of 24. That's why they call it an extra one sixth, even though Milago, if you're just looking at the original number, it really is one fifth. So accordingly, moving down, okay, if the original Sa'ab Min Barrios is 144 eggs, which I bolded, which is true, Yvishamios adds one fifth of this, which is approximately 29. It's actually 28 and four fifths. If you do the math of 144 is, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's 28 and four fifths is one fifth, but it's around 29. So if I add 29, the Sa'ah, once they had the measurement of Yushamiyas, so the Sa'ah now is able to hold 144 plus 29 eggs, which is 173 eggs. Now, the later Tsipurius measure that they added even later for then the Yushamiyas is an additional one sixth, or really one fifth of the Yushamiyas. So one fifth of 173, when they made the measurements even larger, so you get more bang for your buck or whatever, is approximately 34. It's actually 34 and three fifths, which you could have rounded to 35, but the Gemara is gonna round to 34. But remember that you know this helps to adjust for the fact that it was sort of rounding in the opposite direction when it came up to 29, it was really a little less than 29. So that the Sa'at Rashi says all of this. So that the Sa'at is now, 173 plus 34 eggs or 207 eggs. The problem is, as indicated in the next paragraph of the screen share, is that Bunyas sent us to our measure to Rebbe that was 217 eggs. So that doesn't work, not according to the Minbarios measurement, not according to uh, the Yushamios measurement, and not according uh, to uh, the Tsiporios me measurement. It's two eggs too much. So let's go back to the Gemara. The Shia Rebbe, Masan Ushra Rebbe calculated the saw that was said to me. He said, wait a second, there's a volume here of 217 eggs. He sent me too much. Masan Ushra being 217 eggs here. Hasa de Hecha, which saw was Bunyas used in utilizing? In Minbarius, Kuf Memdaladavia. If it was Minbarius, it should have been 144 eggs, right? The saw, the six Kavin and Kavis, 24 eggs, 24 times six, 144. It added another one fifth, which is one sixth in the end. Then it should have been Kufai and Gimel 173 of you. We did the math already. We did Siparius, Reish Zion of you. And if it's Siparius, it should have been 207. So we say, no, the Olam the Siparius ice. Um, uh, um, it, it was Siparius, okay? Um, and the thing is that he also added the amount that would need to be taken off for Chala so that after the Chala would be removed from the dough, there would still be 207 left over. It's like you give somebody the amount that even after taxes, they'll have like the full amount of, you know, the salary, you know, so you don't even have to take off the taxes from the salary, right? So I see Chalsa, Shadi Elayu, um, and he just added that amount. But wait a second, how much is Chala? Chala, you take off 124th, right, of uh, the amount of the dough as a Chala. But as you'll see in the next paragraph of the screen share, 124th of 207 is eight and 15 24 So even if you add eight, or according, according to some opinions, Tosos, I think as the gears they say, well, 15 24 is actually closer to nine. So even if you add nine to 207, 
you're kind of close, but you don't end up with 217. So that's what the Gemara says over here. That's our gear, so that it should be eight. That's eight. Um, it's eight in a fraction. Akasi Batsale, it's still going to be less than 217. Ella, no, what he ended up doing was forget the chala idea. When you're sitting there add on in a premium for the chala, Rabbi would have to take his own chala. What he added on was remember, we said that when uh, Rabbi, when the, when, when the amount was calculated originally, right? Um, uh, by, um, uh, by Rebbe. So Rebbe found an extra 120th in every single egg. So that's what he did. He added on the extra 120th. Remember, what did I say? I said that for every 20 eggs, you have to end up with one extra egg. So if you add an extra egg for every 20 eggs, then you have 200 plus a little bit of change, but you have you know, 200 you know, eggs worth. So you have to add another 10. So once you add an extra 10, once you reach the total of 207, you have 207 plus 10 for a grand total of 217. And don't worry about the remainder, please. Ella, I say the Odos the Rebbe, Shadi Elayu, and he added that amount. So that extra 120 for every 20 eggs gave us 207 plus 10. So Yahachi, Havilate Fei. But as we pointed out, that if you do that, um, it, it was it would end up as you know a little bit uh, a little bit more uh, because you have the remainder amount right you have the extra seven eggs so we say no but since the extra seven don't add up to a beta you need twenty to add up to a beta so a little bit of extra we're not counting we don't count anything that adds up to less than a beta seven out of twenty doesn't add up to a beta fine tanner abundant so are you um so as we mentioned before. When they added to the measures of the Yushamis measure over the Midbaris measure, so they added an extra six. So Yushamis Gisera, Amidbaris Shitus is one sixth, which is really one fifth from the original amount, just one sixth when you look at the total amount in the end. The Shel Sipares Gisera Yushamis Shitus, and the Sipares adds one sixth to the Yushamis. So Nim says, now the Gemara says a cryptic statement. What's the cryptic statement of the Gemara? Nim says, Shel Sipares Gisera Amidbaris Shlish. So it ends up that the Tsiparis is one third more than the Midbaris. Huh? That doesn't quite work out. So Shlish Demon, what exactly is that calculation that the Tsiparis is worth one third more than the Midbaris? Elema Shlish the Midbaris. So we're going to try different ca- calculations here, um, none of which are going to work. Um, if it means that one third of the Midbaris, okay, um, that meaning that the um, uh, so if we say that it's one third of the total midbaris, okay? Um, so mikte shlishta midbaris kamihavi. How much is one third of the midbaris? Well, the midbaris, we said, is 144 eggs to the sa'a. Well, one third of that is 48. Abin bitamanya. That's a 48. Um, the ilu odfa. So we can't say that it's a, the amount that it's, that's it's siparios are greater is the same as that because it's not true at all. The Tsiparios are 207, the uh, Midbarios were 144 eggs. So the amount that the Tsiparios are greater than the Midbarios is 63. That's a lot more than um, one third of the Midbarios eggs, which is 48. So that doesn't work. Okay, so why don't we just say, we're going to calculate one third of the Yushamis eggs. One, the Yushamis eggs are how many? The Yushamis eggs are um, uh, 173. One third of 173 is 57 and two thirds. Shlish di da kamahave, chamshin and tmanya nechi telsa, 57 and two thirds. Bilo odfa, shisinu telas. But the amount that the Tsiparius eggs were greater. Then the Minbarius eggs was, as we mentioned before, 63. The 63 remains the same. Bella the Tsipori, okay. So you'll take one third of the Tsipori of the amount of eggs in a Tsipori cellar. Well, Tsipori cellar has 207 eggs. What's one third of that? One third of that is closer. It's 69. One third of 207, you have to trust me on this, is 69, right? Um, so that's almost the same amount as the number of tzipari, of eggs in a sa'at tziparis that's greater than that of a sa'amid baris, which is 63, right? The difference between 207 
and 144, but it's still six off, right? Sixty-nine. Be the old fault, but the amount that the superis eggs were greater than the baris eggs is not the same. It's only sixty-three. Six is sama gimel. El amar abiyimia. So abiyimia makes a suggestion that appears in the second page over here. Abiyimia suggests that maybe what it means is that it's close. The greater amount of eggs in the superis is close to the amount of one third of the superis eggs in the saw. Uh, difference between sixty-three and sixty-nine. This one third amount, 69, um, in which you have a great amount of eggs in the Tsiparis, is also close to one half of what is the Minbarius amount. What's one half of the Minbarius amount? 70, uh, one half of 144 is 72. So everything is kind of close. That's what it's saying. It's close. That it's close um, uh, to um, uh, what would be one third, as we mentioned before, the difference between 63 and 69, one third of the um, Siparios, and that one third, the 69, is Karl the Mets in the Midbaris. It's close to one half of uh, the eggs in a Midbaris cellar, which is 72. So Moskif La Ravina, so Ravina said, that's not what it says. That's not what it says. It just says that, that um, it is um, uh, that it's one third greater. It says, Nimse shall Siparis Giseva Mibaris Shlish. We find that Siparis is greater than Mibaris one third. It doesn't say Karo, it doesn't say almost. Elam Ravina, Ravina said, I'm going to give you an exact calculation. What's my exact calculation that I'm going to give you? So Ravina says that we have to go back to the added 10 of Rebbe. Remember when Rebbe added the extra 120th for every single egg. So then the 207 eggs of the Tsiparis ends up into uh, ends up as being 217 eggs. So one third of that is 72 and one third. And that's really close to one half of the Midbarius. That's all you meant. You know, not the actual Midbarius, but one half. That will, you know, we'll make that adjustment. One half of the Midbarius is 72, half of 144. That's only a differential of one third of an egg. We'll let you get away with that. So Nim says, so shlish yourself shall sipari bibi, other bibi, odios shall rebi. Once you add those beodes of rebi, that extra 10 eggs, so you have 217. So one third of that, which is 72 and a third, you say, almexa shall midbaris is only a, a greater in amount than one half of the midbarius, which is 72 by a shlish beitza by one third of a beitza. And that's the calculation, which uh, obviously will enable you to remember all of these measurements perfectly. So Taina Rabbanan, so the Brisa teaches us, Reishis Arisosechem, you're supposed to take chala from uh, the uh, amount of the beginning of your dough. Once you have this requisite amount, you're supposed to take chala. What's the requisite amount? Let's turn the page. Kedei Sosechem, it's the amount of your isa. Kami Sosechem, Kedei Isas Midbar, the amount of dough that people would typically have in the Midbar. The kami isa sam midbar. What was the amount of the isa sam midbar? So we have the um, Torah teaches us the ksib beha omer pasuk and shmos asirisai bahu. It's one tenth of an apa. As we mentioned before, an apa is three sin. So that would be one hundred and forty-four um, eggs at times three, or four hundred and thirty-two eggs. One tenth of that is going to be. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a typo there. I apologize. It should have said 43.2 eggs. Okay, I'm sorry. For whatever reason, I wrote 42.3. I meant 43.2 eggs. Sorry about that. Okay, so one tenth of that is 43.2 eggs. Okay, Mikan Amru. So from this, they told you, they tell you Zion Revoim. What's Zion Revoim? A Rev is one quarter. What's one quarter of what? A Lug is one quarter of a Kav. So when we talk about Zion Revoim, we mean seven Lugin. Seven lugin kemach of flour, the ode, and a little bit more is chayevis bechala, is going to be chayev and chala. Why am I measuring in lugin? Because, as I mentioned, every, in every single lug, there are six baits in. Um, so, this is just another way of saying the same thing. If you take a look back in the chart, a sa'ah is also 24 lugin. So, an afa is essentially a 72 lugin because an afa is three sa'ahs. And one tenth of that, is 7.2 lugin. And I have a little paragraph here in which I explain further. A lug is six eggs, as we mentioned. Love, ooh, right? Kaskalav, yagudu. An egg, a lug is six eggs. So 0.2 
of a lug, or 0.2 is the same as one fifth of a lug, would be 1.2 eggs, because 1.2 is one fifth of six, right? Okay, so that gives me a total of 7.2 um, lugin, all right, that um, for which would be seven, um, uh, which would give us uh, this amount. 43.2 eggs, since a lug is six eggs, seven lugin is 42 eggs, and 0.2 lugin is another 1.2 eggs, which gives me the same thing as 43.2 eggs. So don't be worried that the Gemara is giving, is, it seems to be straying off our measurements. It's just saying the same thing. Instead of saying 43.2 eggs, it's saying um, a 7.2 lugin. Um, the lugin are also referred to in the Gemara's revoyim because each lug is one fourth, one quarter of a cup, okay? Um, so now, if I take the 7.2 lugin and I look at the conversions that were made over time, I started with 7.2 lugin that are obligated in chal. If I have that amount of dough, it's obligated in chal. When they changed the amount from, midbar from midbarios to yushamios, they added one sixth, okay? So they added one sixth, so I don't need as much um, in order to uh, get to, to uh, the total measure a flour that's going to be chayev in chala since they added, you know, extra amounts. So the, so the 7.2 lugin of flour that are obligated in chala become reduced as follows. Just follow along now. Six lugin, okay, I have a total of 7.2 lugin, but I'm going to first start with the six lugin. The six lugin become five lugin because from every six, I becomes, you know, I only need five of the original measure because it all became condensed Whatever was six of the old measure is condensed into five in the new measure. So six lugin become now five lugin, and the remaining 1.2 lugin, which are a total of uh, six eggs, okay, plus 1.2 eggs, because I have six lugin in one lug, and I have one point, and I have uh, 0.2 eggs in the next lug. So those, so the six eggs become five eggs, and the 1.2 eggs become one egg. If I'm making out of every six, I'm making five. So there are, you know. There are six, one, there are six, um, um, I, I could take one fifth uh, uh, and, and multiply it by six and I get 1.2. Uh, if I multiply it by five, I get one. So the 1.2 eggs become one egg. So that gives me a total of six eggs, which equals, as we said, one more lug. So therefore the six lugin become one lug, we become, um, the six lugin become five lugin. The 1.2 lugin become another one lug. So the 7.2 lugin become a total of six lugin in the Yushami measure. Um, and then when the Yushami measure was changed to the Tsipori measure, so then whatever was six became condensed into five. So that's easy. Whatever was six lugin in the Yushami measure become five lugin in the Tsipori measure. So that's what we have right now. Five lugin um, of this new Tsipori measure is going to become chayev in chala. What does it translate into for us if we're just curious? It translates into, it's a big maklokis, somewhere between three to five pounds of flour, which is going to um, become chayev in chala. So we'll read it inside. Which become condensed at the six of, of the Ushamis measures. Shen hei shel sipori, which is equivalent to five of the sipori measures. We kind of move from here. They uh, Chazal said, If you ate this amount, which is about three to five pounds of flour, according to our calculations, every day you eat dough, you eat bread of this amount every day. So then you're going to be a healthy person. Hareze um, bari You're going to be a healthy and blessed person. Yes, so I can eat more than that. Come on. Rav son, then you're going to be a gluttonous person. You're eating something like, you know, more than four chalas a day, more than like four, you know, Shabbos chalas a day. Pachos mikan, mekulko b'meyev. But if you eat, you know, less than that, it's going to really mess badly with your digestive system. So at least in the olden days, in the time of the Gemara, that amount was considered to be a healthy amount for one person to consume every single day. Uh, I would say we probably have, you know, moved, uh, you know, beyond that so that um, maybe we don't eat quite as much, you know, we eat other things, you know, instead to supplement it, but that was considered to be a healthy amount to eat in those days. And that puts an end to this particular screen share. I'm going to see if I can move to the next one. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think this is the one that I need over here. Okay, let's see if this works. 
Now I have to rotate this. Wait, oh, but I have something that's blocking the view. How do I get rid of this? Oh, okay, good, excellent. Yes. Okay, good. Let's move on to the Mishnah here. Okay. I have people who live in a courtyard that's over here. This courtyard leads to these homes. You go through this door, you go into these homes. And then if you go out the courtyard over here, where if you can see my arrow, you go out to the Rashid Sarabim. Okay, that's the Anshe Khatsev. Anshe Mepes is the people who live on the second story. They get there by going up a ladder. The ladder brings them to a balcony. That balcony is what we call the Merpeset. So it's also, so it's kind of like a separate domain. Okay, Shashakukovalo Irvu, but they didn't make an Erev together. Each one on its own made an Erev with their own residence. The first floor residents made an Erev with themselves, the, the courtyard residents. The second floor residents made an Erev for themselves, okay? But they forgot to make an Erev with each other, so they're not going to be able to, like, you know, share things with each other. Okay, Shashakukovalo Irvu. Now I have things that are standing up like outside, okay, of the um, of the building. Some things are like you know high up, and some things are you know you might have like a, a pillar which is standing up. So whatever is above ten tefachim is going to belong to the people on the second story. Hakas mikan anything which is below ten tefachim, which is within say the ten tefachim of the people who live on the bottom floor, so it's convenient for them, it's going to belong to them. If you have for a, um, you have a pit, um, why would you have a pit? I don't know. But if you did have a pit, you know, in, let's see, did they draw that? They didn't even draw a pit. Oh my goodness. Okay, I don't know. Um, if you have a sabor ve'asela, you have a pit which is outside of the, uh, outside of the building, and it has kind of like, it's a dirt wall around it so that it adds up to 10 tefachim. Shein gevoi masar tefachim, if it's 10 tefachim high, so that the people in the bottom story, you know, would have to like, you know, throw up a, a bucket in order to get into it. And the people in the Mepesik could just sort of lower, you know, their hands from their windows in order to access it within 10 tefachim. So then it's going to belong to them. It's less than 10 tefachim. So it's easier to access for the people on the lower story. So then uh, it's going to belong to them. That's if uh, the, uh, the pit um, uh, that you're filling up, you know, let's say it's filled with water and you want to fill up the water from it or take food from it, whatever is, happens to be filled up in the pit. That's if it's within four tefachim horizontally from the walls. But if it's further than four tefachim horizontally from the walls, which isn't all that much. I mean, we're talking about, you know, maybe 14 and a half inches over here to be four tefachim away. And even if it's 10 tefachim high, it's too far away for the people on the second story, goes to the chatzir, we'll see exactly what that means. Maybe it means that it's equally inconvenient for both of them, and therefore neither of them have the right to it. What's considered to be smucha, close to it, um, horizontally closer to uh, the residents, if it's not four tefachim away. Okay, fine. So the Gemara says, If something is equally accessible to both, it's within 10 tefachim of uh, the people on the second floor if they would just lower their hands, and it's within 10 tefachim of the people on the first floor if they would just you know, raise their hands up, so it's within 10 tefachim, it's equally accessible, so then it's going to be ushered to both of them. And when we had the case of the coattail between the two people, where if it was four tefachim wide, then you could like climb up to the coattail and eat the fruit there, but you couldn't take the fruit, you know, down from the coattail. But, you know, otherwise it's going to be us, sir. You certainly couldn't take things from there to where you are. And if it's less than four tefachim, there's nothing to talk about. So it's going to be equally us for both of them, right? Lezeb is rika, lezeb is rika. Haino coattail, shebein, beis, chatseros. So that's what we said over here. Um, and that if it is um, going to be um, equally, you know, difficult for both of them to reach. So that's like the co sale that we just mentioned. If I have a, um, a wall, which is a two, between a two, um, a two chatseros, it's going to be, um, uh, it's going to, uh, to be prohibited uh, to, um, uh, to both of them. Okay, um, one second. Fine. Um, if the two of them can only reach there, the two, if the, if, the, if the two of them both would have to lower themselves 
by at least 10 Tfachim. So that's like if I have a ditch between uh, um, two uh, courtyards, but we say that if they didn't make an Erev together, neither of them are allowed to use it. Lezeba Pesach, Lezeba Zrika. If one of them is within their 10 Tfachim reach and the other one would have to like go up 10 Tfachim, they would have to like uh, throw um, uh, throw something up 10 Tfachim in order to, uh, to reach there. So then it's considered more convenient for the one that's within 10 Tfachim and they get to use it. Um, which is what Rabbi Barfuna um, Rav Nachman said on Daf Ayin Zayin Amunal. If one of them would have to lower uh, themselves more than 10 Tfachim to reach something, like for them it's a ditch, but for the other person, they're situated lower down, so it's within their 10 Tfachim of reach, so then it belongs to them in the event that the two entities did not make an Erev together. Which is what Rav Nachman said on the same Daf. So now we're going to have a machlokis. What if one of them would have to go down more than 10 tfachim? That's called shilshul. They have to lower themselves more than 10 tfachim. The other one would have to like raise themselves. They, you know, they would have to, if they, they would have to like, you know, throw something to get there. Um, they would have to raise themselves more than 10 tfachim. But which one is it considered to be more convenient? Do we say that we give it to the one for to whom it's more convenient? Or that it's equally inconvenient for both of them, and therefore neither of them have the right to access of access to it. So my, so how does that work? So I'm a Rav Shnei and Asur. So Rav says it's considered to be equally inaccessible to both, and therefore neither of them is allowed to utilize that pit, utilize that pillar, whatever it happens to be. Shmuel says no. The one that we have to be go down of ten falcon gets it. Because it's easier to lower yourself down than to have to scale something which is 10 fachim high. Shmuel says you give it to the one for, to whom it's more comfortable, and therefore you give it to the one who would have to lower himself down. So how does that stem with our Mishnah? Tonight our Mishnah says, that, you know, and this is all, all these cases are talking about where the two entities didn't make an Erev together. So if we spoke in our mission about the Anshi Katsu and the Anshi Mepesis, they made an Erev amongst themselves, no problem taking from the balcony, you know, to the upper st- uh, story uh, apartments, no problem taking from the courtyard to the lower story apartments. The question is, all of the things that would be kind of like of equal accessibility to the people of the upper story and the lower story. So we said, if they didn't make an Erev together, so then those things cannot be automatically accessed by both. Only if it's 10 trachim high does it go to the people of the Merpeset. And if it is Pakos Mikan, it's lower than that. Lachatzer, only then does it go to the people of the Chatzer. So Kasaka Daitik, my Merpeset. So this perhaps is a support for Shmuel because maybe what does it mean, Merpeset? Merpeset means like this in this uh, drawing. Uh, that you have to go, you take a ladder to get to the balcony, but then in order to get to your apartment, you got to go on yet another ladder to get to your apartment. And if you're going to use something which is 10 tefachim high, you're going to have to lower yourself down from your um, from your window, um, from your entrance, from your door, your entranceway, you're going to have to lower yourself more than 10 tefachim in order to be able to access that which is 10 tefachim it's, it's true that it's 10 tefachim above the ground, so it's not convenient for the people of the courtyard, but it's also 10 tefachim below your reach. And nonetheless, we say, we're going to give it to you. We're going to give it to you. Um, so get now to onto the Gemara and pay down and olive. <coughs> so my, um, so Kasanka Daitik, my Mepesa Pene Aliyah. So we thought, um, so maybe this is a support for Shmuel that the Mepesa means, the Bene Mepesa means that they're all the way up far above the balcony. So the Gemara answers, Umay Karolam Mepeset, the Kasaki Mepeset. When we call them the people of the Mepeset of the balcony, means that they go up to the balcony, and from the balcony, they walk up with ladders to their, to their doors, to their entranceways. Alma, so that seems to support Shmuel. Kol Zebeshilshul, Lezebeshbizrika, Nosinosa, Lezebeshilshul. That whenever, um, for one person, namely the people on the ground over here, this guy, if you could see him, um, and he would have to like, you know, go up 10 Tfachim. So we say, sorry, Charlie, you don't get it because that's going to be hard for you to scale. But for this guy over here, you know what? So you got to lower yourself more than 10 Tfachim. Um, and that's okay because that's considered to be more convenient. Um, so we'll give it to the Lazesh of so We'll give it to this guy over here, okay, in the window. You want a close-up of the guy? You're not really going to get a close-up. They didn't really draw faces in this book. 
Uh, so we answer no. It's going like um, uh, it's, Rav Huna explains this works out even according to Rav. The Osana Dara which when we say that they don't get it, that the people um, uh, in the Mepese to get it, uh, get access, and the people in the courtyard don't get access, that's when it's within their ten falchim because they live right there. They don't live high up in, the, in, an, in an upper story which you can only ascend with ladders. They're, the entranceway to their houses is right next to the Mepese, right next to the balcony. So therefore, it's for this thing over here might be ten falchim uh, high for the people in the courtyard, but it's within ten falchim of the reach of somebody who's standing on the balcony. So it's a Pesach. It's considered anything which is within ten falchim is considered a Pesach, easy access, an op- easy access opening. And therefore, that's why they have a right. But if they would have to bend down more than ten falchim, so then they would not have the right to access uh, this item or this pillar um, that they want to take something from, okay? So hakinami, um, so just like Rafuna said that in a different context, which hopefully we'll get to, hakinami, the osen adarim and mepeset, so to over here, we're talking about the people who are living directly next to the mepeset, next to the balcony, not living on an upper floor that they can only ascend with a ladder, and therefore it is not a contradiction to Rav at all. Ihaki, but if that's the case, ema seifa, so how do you understand the seifa? Pachos mikan lechotzer. We said that if it's less than that, so then it belongs to the people in the chotzer. So am I, but why should it belong to the people in the chotzer if it's less than ten tfachim? The people on the balcony still are able to access it within ten tfachim, so therefore it should be equal access to both. If it's less than ten tfachim from the ground, less than ten tfachim from the balcony, so it's equal access to both, and they both should be usher. So, uh, so is it Lazeb Pesach, Lazeb Pesach? So he answered no. When it says there, my Lachatzer, that's within the 10th Falkim of the Chatzer, goes to people of the Chatzer, it means it's also accessible to people of the Chatzer, and therefore it's off limits to both, since it's equally accessible to both. And they both would be prohibited. And that's uh, similar to uh, the case of uh, the um, uh, of uh, the chalon, the window between the two kaseris that didn't make the Arab with each other, that neither of them would be able to use that window a- area. So hakinami mistaba, this actually stands to reason based on the latter case, which is mentioned in the Mishnah, I mean, the tiny sefer, because the latter case in the Mishnah said that we only give the access to the people in the uh, Mirpese, we only give uh, the access if it's within fourth falcon horizontally of uh, their, uh, their doors. If it's within Fort Falcom, it's legis, but if it's far away, more than Fort Falcom away, where they have to, you know, stretch out horizontally and go down and lower themselves, then even in Safilu Gaboy, you'd Falcom Lachatzer. It belongs to the Chatzer people, even if it's higher than 10 Falcom. Why should it belong to them? It's higher than 10 Falcom. It's still inconvenient for them. They still have to scale a, a high um, uh, altitude in order to uh, be able to access the item if I have a pillar which is greater than 10 falcons. So my lechatzer, so elam and lechatzer is shari. You're gonna say it belongs to the lechatzer people and therefore it's permitted? No, I'm not to Travayahu. It's uh, within the same domain as both because it's higher than 10 falcons from the lechatzer. It's within the domain of the upper story. It's just that they can't access it easily because it's one and fourth falcon away horizontally. Elamai lechatzer, what does it mean at lechatzer? It means, that it's an equally accessible or inaccessible to people of the chassim, and therefore it's us to both. Af the chassim shnei and asurin. So hakinami here too. My the chassim af the chassim shnei and asurin. It means that it's as accessible to the people of the chassim, but they both would be prohibited because it's lezeb is riko lezeb is shilshul shema mina. So therefore, this works out according to the opinion of Rab Tanan. So the Mishnah had also spoken about the case of the chulyas habor, right? The chulyas habor. Um, uh, where I have a large pit. I don't have a picture of this for some reason. I have a large pit in uh, the middle. Let me see if uh, there's a picture in one of uh, the other, uh, I don't know. We, you know what, we'll, we'll move on to Seder. So we'll see if there's a picture later on. If I have a large pit with um, a, the um, dirt walls that, they, that rise, um, above uh, ten tefachim above uh, the chutzir, so the people of the chutzir would not be able to access it without scaling up um, a ten tefachim of altitude. It's not convenient for them, so we say it goes to the people of the mepesed of the second story. Pachas mikan the chutzir. If it's less than that, less than ten tefachim from the ground, it goes to the people of the chutzir. So Amr Rafuna, so Rafuna says that um, uh, this is this is the Rafuna 
that we were, um, this would seem to be a kasha to rob because presumably the people have to um, lower themselves, um, uh, the people have to lower the, lower themselves ten tfachim in order to uh, access uh, the, um, the bore, in order to access the pit. We're assuming again that we're talking about people who are living like in an upper story way above the balcony and way above wherever the pit would be. Um, so they have to go down more than 10 tfachim um, in order to access the pit, and yet we say that they're allowed to do so. So Afuna says, no, this is the answer that we gave before. We're talking about the people who live right here on the balcony itself, and therefore they don't have to lower themselves 10 tfachim. So So I understand that with respect to, to a rock. I can have a rock um, that you know goes up you know, where you don't have to lower yourself 10 tfachim, but a boar, a pit, by definition, you got to go to the bottom of the pit. Got to go to the bottom of the pit. You're going to be lowering yourself ten tefachim. Michael Mamer. So our Yitzchak Brady, Rabbi Yehuda, no. We're talking about a pit that's filled with water. So when you get to the top of the pit, which is in within ten tefachim of the balcony, so then um, you don't have to lower yourself anymore, and they would be able to access it within ten tefachim of where they're standing. But wait a second, doesn't water eventually um, um, evaporate? Or when they, two different shotim, either water eventually evaporates or every time they fill up from water, it's going to get lower and lower. And then a subsequent time that they use it, the water is going to be below 10 falcon of their reach. So we say, Since when the water is filled up to the top of the pit, it's going to be within 10 falcon of their reach. So therefore, even when it becomes lower than that um, by evaporation or by usage, it's also going to be okay. So we say, Adarabba, what are you talking about? We don't, we're not looking for kulos over here. It should be the other way around. Since eventually it's going to become usher, we don't have a kivan to hutra hutra type of consideration over here because it's the sort of thing that's expected to eventually um, become deficient over the course of Shabbos. So therefore, Kimalya, that's how the Meforshim explained this, uh, the shock of the Tower here. Kimalya Nami Asira, therefore, even when it's filled up with water, it should be Yasser as well. Okay, true. Ella, but we'll give a different explanation. Ella, Mabai, we can still resurrect this according to Rob, that it's all going to be within 10 Tfakim of the use of uh, these guys who are living on the balcony. Ella, Mabai, Yakabibuam Leia Peros Askinan. We're talking about um, a, a, a pit which is filled up with fruit. Um, and uh, therefore, you know, fruit doesn't evaporate, right? Uh, the so we say, yeah, it doesn't evaporate, but people can still take the fruit away. They'll take the fruit away over the, I mean, people like fruit. I like grapes, right? I have a pit full of grapes. I'm going to eat lots of those grapes over the course of Shabbos. And then um, it's going to, the, and then the, the, the surface level of where the grapes are, is going to be lower and lower over the course of Shabbos until I'll have to go all the way, more than 10 them down in order to access the grapes. So how is that okay? Um, so we say, Betibla, no, these are grapes I'm not going to use over the course of Shabbos because they're still tevil. I can't take trumos and maestros on Shabbos itself. I'm just going to use it because I'm going to put my books there. I'm going to like put my safer on top of the grapes. That's how I'm going to use it. I'm not going to actually remove the grapes themselves. Betibla, a steak and nami. Um, and this also seems to make sense because what did we say? We said that it's similar to a cellar, right? Because we said um, that it's a bit, um, uh, that, that we, we compared it. We said, Sela v'chuya sabor. That was what uh, the Mishnah said. The Mishnah spoke about um, if I have either a chuya um, sabor v'hasela, so that the bor is similar to the sela, just like the rock it doesn't you know, move, the, the rock doesn't become depleted on Shabbos. So the bor, whatever the contents of the bor, are not going to be depleted on Shabbos either. Doing it the sela, shmami nav. Lamely miss the bor, lamely miss the sela. Why don't I just give the example of cellar? And then I'll know that if I have a boar, it has to be similar to a cellar that the items can't be taken away on Shabbos. No, Srikh, I need both. Yes, we need cellar because if I only would have said cellar, it's a lake and a mixer because there's nothing to be goes there. The rocks uh, are not uh, going to go away over the course of Shabbos. Uh, the, the rock is, is the rock. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's just a piece of, you know, um, it's a, uh, it, it's, 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 it's a monolith of a boar ligzer, but a boar, you have to be goes there that sometimes the contents are going to go away. There will be times that the grapes are not going to be tevel, that they're going to be misukan, and people you know, might use the grapes, so you might forget to distinguish between the time that they're tevel and the time that they're not tevel. Ligzer zim and demalya peros misukanin. Sometimes they're going to be peros they actually can't eat with the trumus and were already taken. 
Srika, so therefore has to teach you no. When it is a type of fruit that you're not going to be able to remove that Shabbos because it's devil, so then you're going to be allowed to use it. You can put your safer down on top of the grapes, however you want to use it. Tashma. Okay, next case. If I had the people of the Chatzir and the Aliyah, of the bottom floor and the top floor, that they forgot to make an Erev, right? Um, that's um, so. Anshi Chatzir Mishtamshin. This price says that the Anshi Chatz are allowed to use people of the courtyard could use the bottom ten falcon and the people of the um, upper story can use the uh, ten uh, upper the upper story can use the ten upper falcon. Kesa, how does that work? That's this picture over here. If I have a ziz, I have uh, some uh, type of a protrusion. I have a ledge. I have a ledge that protrudes from the wall. Kesa ziz yotzim in a kotel lamata miasora. The If it's in the bottom ten tefachim, so the people of the chutzir get to use it. Fine. Lamala meyasara. If it's above ten tefachim, so that's over here. So then the people of the upper story get to use it. That all makes sense. Lalia. Had the beni beni aser. Oh, now this appears to be a kasha and shmuel. But the ones that are in between, where the people of the aliyah would have to go down ten tefachim to utilize the the ledge. The people on the bottom floor would have to go up 10 tefachim to utilize the ledge. So we seem to indicate it's also to both of them. That supports Rav, and that's against Shmuel, right? So Amar, um, um, so Amar Rav, um, Nachman, Hacha, Bekosel, Tisha, Asar, Askinon. He says, no, we could be talking about where it is a coastal wall, which is only 19 tefachim high. Since it's only 19 tefachim high, so therefore, um, I'm not going to have um, a, this type of a situation where I'm going to have any sort of baini baini where anyone's going to need to go down 10 tefachim. It's always going to be within 10 tefachim of somebody, right? Because it's Tisha Asr. This is Yosef Yemen Lamata Meyasara Lezeh Pesach. So we say, and that then there's a ziz that goes out. There's a, um, uh, a ledge that goes out. This is Yosef Yemen Lamata Meyasara uh, so if it's below 10 tefachim, so then it's going to uh, be easily accessible to the people on the bottom story because it's going to be within their 10 tefachim and the others and the people on the upper story would have to go down more than 10 tefachim. The malam and it's above 10 tefachim, so then it's going to be equally e easily accessible within 10 tefachim to the people on the upper story um, and it's going to be uh, above the 10 tefachim threshold for the people on the bottom story, so that's going to be Lezeba Pesach well, the Zeb is Rika, that these people would have to like, you know, throw something to get on top of it. Um, and uh, therefore, it's always going to uh, be clearly more convenient within a Pesach, within a 10 Tfachim um, range um, uh, to people on either of, of the, the bottom story or the second story. You're not going to have a Zeb is Shilshul and a Zeb is Rika situation altogether. Okay, fine. Next, turn the page to a pay dollar um, and base. Let me see if I can access the next group of photos. Um, hold on. I, I have no idea how to do this anymore. One second. Wait, I had a whole bunch of photos and now I'm only getting one. One moment. Uh, hold on. Let's try this. Okay. Okay, I got the pictures, but I can't rotate them. But that's still better than nothing. Okay, um, so here, here's the picture of the Kosel, which is 19 19th Falcon that we just mentioned, but we don't really need a picture of that. We sort of understood that. And now, what do we have here? We have the Shtegazus Tros. Okay. Okay. Um, if I can figure out how to rotate, I will, but I'm not sure. Okay. So now let's turn the page. Um, Tashma, Shtegazus Tros. If I have two Gizus Tros, I have people who are living above the water. They're living kind of like, you know, on the dock. I have two homes on the dock, and they like to fill up from the water. So in this picture over here, uh, if I can, I can't really go beyond the page over here. Um, all right. Um, Use well, the view drop down. You should be able to, uh, where it says view up at the top there, you should be able to rotate it. 
Oh, wait, now I lost it all okay. together. Whoops. Back on, back into Adobe. Next to document, which is view. View, right okay, I have the view. Okay, rotate view. There you go. Clockwise, it doesn't really matter. No. <laughs> Wow. Okay, Shkaya. Okay, so here I have these people who are living on a. Ah, I lost it. Okay, they're living uh, on this dock, and as you can see, um, it's possible you've allowed. If you have a ledge that goes out from your home, if you um, if you build a little bit of a machitza underneath, I'm trying to get to the top picture of the page. Um, yeah, so uh, here I, 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 this is cut off a little bit, but you can see there's like a machitza, like a ten tefach machitza underneath your ledge. You have like a little hole in the top, and you make a ledge, and you could take a, uh, you could take a bucket, and then you can lower the bucket into the water, even though it's a machitza tzluya, when make to allow machitza tzluya when you're next to water. Now this guy, that this guy in the top ledge that you can barely see made a machitza. This guy in the bottom ledge didn't, and he wants to be able to use. The mechitza, the guy in the top ledge, they built this little mechitza thing, beshutfus, but Lamaisa, they didn't make an Arab with each other. So that's the problem. They didn't make an Arab with each other. So it says uh, the, um, so we have a din. If one is on top of the other, right? Um, and um, this is uh, discussed on the Dafei and Amad Beis. Asa lil yonam alasa tachtona. The top guy made a little mechitza, a little um, area of ten tefachim where he could lower his pail and bucket into the water, but the bottom guy didn't. So since they didn't make an error with each other, so neither of them, and they have like a shutfus, so neither of them is going to be able to use the unless they make an error with each other. So how, why is that? So according to Shmuel, um, that shouldn't be the case because for this guy, he's able to uh, kind of, you know, go down the shulshu by lowering his bucket. This one would have to, um, uh, would, would have to like throw a bucket, you know, on top. He would have to throw a bucket on top in order for the, the um, in order for, he'd have to like throw a rope on top for the bucket to go down the hole that's now on the upper perch. So therefore for him, it's bizrika, it's much less convenient so we should say, if they didn't make an aim, give it to the guy who could just lower without having to like, you know, throw up and then go down. Um, so that would appear to be a kasha on Shmuel. So Amar Abad the Baraba, no. We're talking about where this guy who's on the bottom, he's going to erect a ladder. He's not planning to throw up a rope. He's planning to walk up and then just lower directly. So therefore, it's Lezeb Shoshul, Lezeb Shoshul. They both would be lowering directly. They both would have the same type of access. And that's the reason why we answer it, because of the fact that they didn't make an error of it. It's the same type of access. So Abaye Amar, so Abaye says that um, I can give you a, a, a different explanation. If you go in the Kaiman Misoka Sarada Dadi, Shmuel would agree that if they're within 10 Tvachim of each other, that uh, this guy on the bottom is so close to the guy in the top that they're within 10 tefachim of each other, uh, that because they're so close to each other, um, and therefore uh, we say uh, that it's basically the same type of access. And since it's basically like a window between two courtyards, and since it's the same type of access, therefore, if they didn't make an error, if they're going to ask them each other, we don't look at the convenience factor that this one's going to do it pishulshul and this one's going to do it pizrika pishulshul. That's not relevant when they're within 10 tefachim from each other. Let me buy a comer. And when we talk about the fact um, that um, we're not going to allow the person who's on the top uh, to do it, it's not to teach you that, oh, even though it's more convenient for him than it's Bishoshul, and with the other guy, it's going to be Bizrika Bishoshul, that's the reason why it's, um, we're teaching you a chiddush, uh, to teach you the din of Rav that it's prohibited. No, it's the Lomi, we're teaching you a totally different story. Lomi Baya, Asula Tachtona, that not only would it clearly be the case if the guy in the bottom made the mechitza, that because of the fact 
that they are within uh, ten tefachim of each other. Therefore, they prohibit each other from any use. Ella, afilu asila yonav lo asila taktona. Rather, the chiddush is that even if the top guy was the one who had the mechitza, who had like this uh, little uh, open area with, with walls that he had created underneath his ledge so that he can lower his pail to the water that you can just barely see in this picture over here. I might have thought that since in the normal course, when one person is able to do things just by lowering, we give it to him. Um, and in the normal course, I would have given it to the guy who's able to just lower it down as opposed to the guy who would have to like go up with a rope and so forth. Uh, and I still don't do it since we're talking about a case where they are within 10 tefachim of each other, where they're basically considered to be in the same domain. Like the case of Nachman Amashmuel, which is sort of a difficult case where Rashi and Tosos have very different understandings of this case. Neither are objectively easy to understand. So we're going to go with the picture of Rashi, okay, which is this black and white picture um, uh, that we have in the bottom left uh, corner over here where it says Rashusa Rabin, that goes like this. Let's say I have a, um, a roof right here. You see this roof? Um, the roof is near the Rashusa Rabin. It's more than 10 tefachim above the level of the people who are going to be standing on the Rashus Rabin. Normally, they'd have nothing to do with that because they have to like, you know, put something on top of a 10 tefach region so I would think that they have no rights to this roof compared to the people who might live inside of this building. But in this particular case, we're going to say because the people of the Rishu Sarabim are right nearby, it's going to be usher for both of them to use the roof. Um, what is the case? The only way it's going to be permissible for these people on the balcony over here um, to, uh, to use the roof is if they stand up a permanent ladder from which they can ascend from the balcony to the roof. Only then are they going to be allowed to use the roof. But if they don't have a permanent ladder, it's just like a temporary ladder, then they're not gonna be allowed to use the roof because then we say that they have not um, removed the access of the roof from the B'nai Rishu Sarabim. in, If it only be a temporary ladder, it's not good enough. My time, I mean, like if they decide to put up a temporary ladder during Shabbos to get some stuff from the roof, they're not going to be allowed to. My time, it must be because if you look at the balcony itself from which the ladder is being perched um, that goes to the roof, so that balcony is less than 10 tefachim high from the Rishu Sarabim. Since it's less than 10 tefachim high, from the Rishu Sarabim, it's considered like there is equal access from the standpoint of the people in the balcony as there is from the standpoint of the people in the Rishu Sarabim. And therefore, unless there's a permanent ladder erected, it's going to be also even for the people of the balcony, despite the fact that they're within 10 Tfakim of the roof as well, it's going to be, as Rashi says, it's going to be prohibited for them to utilize the roof. Even though the people in the Rishus Arabim may have to go up 10 Tfakim to use the roof, it's still going to be us. So why is that? It must be because there's a special rule that whenever the two domains are within 10 Tfakim of each other, they prohibit each other, right? Okay, Q-E-D, Asana Dadi. So Maskit Baba Papa, Papa says, not so fast, not so fast. That's not necessarily true. The Dilma Kisharabi, Mikasin Allah, Bekumma Sima, Bekumsa Besudra. Maybe we're talking about a case where there is a specially heightened usage on the people of the Rishu Sarabim. It's true. Normally, if a roof is 10 tefachim high from the people of the Rishu Sarabim, you might think that that's beyond their normal access. But in this particular case, they, when they pass by in the Rishu Sarabim, they put their hats. You know, you come to shul. You got to find a place to hang your hat. You know, I'm always like looking, you know, for some sort of a hook to hang my hat or whatever. So you're going to put your hat up. Even if it's higher than 10 tefachim, you don't have a place for your hat. You're very happy, or your scarf, you gotta put your scarf somewhere. You know, your scarf, your coat, your hat, you gotta put it somewhere. So they find that this is a very convenient usage to put their hats or their scarves, their kumsa, which is their hat, for sudra, their scarves, to put on the very top of the roof over here, even though it's more than 10 tefachim. But it's nothing to do with the fact that the Rishu Sarabim people are within 10 tefachim of where the balcony are. So that's not necessarily a proof. And I think that we should probably stop here. We'll begin tomorrow, Yes, Hashem. 
the very last line of Pei Dalet Amun Beis. Have a wonderful day. Shukar. Shukar. Thank you. Shukar. 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 Shukar.